All right. So our next talk will be Sergei Melikov uh, from the Steklov Institute. Uh, not all links are isotopic to PL links. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and uh, thank you all the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so I'm going to talk about topological links and their isotopy. Uh, by a link, uh, today I mean a topological embedding of a finite uh, joint union of circles in S3. So a topological embedding in this case is just an injective continuous map. But everything is compact. Uh, two links are called isotopic if they are homotopic through links. So every moment of the homotopy must be injected. That's all essential. Um, yeah, so this is not ambient isotopy. And an example is that if you have any piecewise linear node, then you can actually isotope it to the unknown. Um, so probably most people know this, but let me say it quickly that you can just imagine this node tied, tied on a rope and make it a little smaller and then uh, take the two strands of the rope coming out of the knot and pull them apart. So that this knot becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until it becomes just a single point. Uh, so actually every moment of this homotopy is injective. Everything is through embeddings. So it's a valid isotopy, although it doesn't extend to an ambient isotopy of S3. So you can do it with every PL node. And, um, but uh, Rosen asked the following problem. If you have a node which is not PL, is it going to be isotopic to a PL not always, or equivalent to the unknown? And he actually offered a potential counterexample. So the so-called Bing link uh, might be not isotopic to the unknown. And I believe it is still unknown whether it is. There have been some partial results. So some people looked at this problem, but it's still open, I believe. Well, I'm going to prove uh, 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 something similar, but not exactly that. So uh, not all links are isotopic to PL links. Okay, so one more definition. Two M component links are called by equivalent if they compound the topological embedding of M on Eli in S3 cross the initial. Um, so this is very similar to concordance, except that we don't require local flatness. If this embedding were locally flat, then this would be called concordance. You don't assume local flatness. <clears throat> so uh, Ethan proved, or rather uh, Ethan's shift spinning construction proved that every knot, every topological knot in S3 is I equivalent to the unknot. And I'm going to prove that there exists a two component link which is not I equivalent to any PLD. And obviously, this second theorem applies the first one because uh, isotopy is a special type of I equivalence. Uh, uh, there are some more things to say about it, like that Milner invariants don't help new invariants and uh, various other things, but uh, I would like to focus on the proof. Uh, since I don't have much time, I think I should just go directly to it. And the proof is going to be by a, a series of examples which build on one another, and in the end we will get an example which just proves this theorem. Um, and yeah, so so uh, the the idea of proof is to define to, to extend Cochrane's derived invariants to topological links, and actually that's it. So I would say the proof is quite simple, and it is surprising that nobody has done it before. Um, all right, so. Uh, yeah, let us now look at 
nodes and links as subsets of S3. So we forget the parameterization of nodes and links, but we remember their orientation and the numbering of the components. So let's have a let's look at such a node in S3, uh, and uh, if it is wild, it doesn't necessarily have a ciphered surface, but uh, it is going to have an edge ciphered surface. So an edge ciphered surface for a topological node K is an oriented, properly embedded, smooth surface in the complement to this node, such that the following diagram works. So namely, we have, uh, we can, yeah, so F represents, F, F is a cycle in homology with, uh, based on infinite chains. So this is also called locally finite homology or Borel move homology. So F just gives a cycle in it, uh, which determines a homology class. And then this, uh, 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 homology group is isomorphic to the relative thin rod homology of S3 modular the node. So this is very elementary for a thin rod theory. For instance, you can find this uh, everything in Massey's book. It has this first homology of first kind, which is thin rod homology, and homology of second kind, which is well known. Um, and then for Stinrod homology, it is uh, homology theory. It has uh, the exact sequence of pair, and in particular, it has a boundary homomorphism. We we'll take that boundary homomorphism, and it is obviously an isomorphism. And so we get the composition and the requirement that the composition uh, sends a, uh, the fundamental class of our surface F to the Class represented by the node K. It's a pretty natural requirement. It's just a little bit, well, maybe not everybody is familiar with uh, all these groups, but otherwise it's trivial. Yeah, so, uh, however, this F, uh, uh, this H cipher surface F, it need not be a real ciphered surface, even when K is a PL node, because even in that case, its closure in S3 may fail to be a manifold with boundary. Okay, so even for PL nodes, we are looking at something more general than usual ciphered surfaces. All right, now let's define the subtle Levine invariant. Let's extend it for topological links. Suppose we have a two component link with linking number zero. Uh, well, there is a lemma that the first component has an edge cipher surface that is disjoint from the second component. Well, this is proved by the contracting construction uh, using um, the Alexander duality between Steenrod homology and Chekhov homology. It's uh, Nothing special if you know those things. And if we believe that, then uh, by symmetry, the second component also has a nice separate surface in the complement to the first. Uh, then we may assume that these two Zyphert surfaces meet transversely, and then they meet along a closed one manifold because, um, well, each is disjoint from the non-compact uh, end of the other one. And this uh, one manifold is going to be oriented because everything is oriented. So are your sigma and sigma prime smooth or are they just topological surfaces? Smooth, smooth. Mm -hmm. we, we can make them smooth because the complement to the knot is a smooth three manifold and right. this is going to be a two-dimensional smooth submanifold. Yeah, so transversality here is just usual smooth transversality. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, so since these ciphered surfaces are oriented uh, and we can fix some orientation of S3, then we get a framing for each of these ciphered surfaces. So we just uh, 
need to choose the site and that gives us a frame. Then the intersection F is also a frame because we take the first vector from the first surface and the second vector from the second surface that give us, gives us a frame. Okay, and then the Sato-Levine environment of our original link L is just the self-linking number of this framed one manifold. So in more detail, it is the total linking number of F with its push off along the sum of the two vectors of the frame. In fact, it is not important. You can take the push off along the first vector or along the second vector, it's going to be the same. As it, as it uh, but the way we define it, it's clear that this uh, Levine environment is symmetric with respect to interchanging the components. And another way of, of, of looking at it is that we, we, we take the frame bodies in class of this uh, frame uh, one manifold in S3. And by the Schrodinger construction, that's I3 of S2, which is that. And then that's it in our image. Okay, theorem beta is well defined and is an environment of high fluidness. So it's proved by usual arguments, just using Spinner cohomology. Nothing special. Okay. Example, let's look at this twisted whitehead link. So it has this twisting here, which is uh, two full twists in this picture. So it's Wn and n equals two in this picture. If you take that one full twist, then it's a usual whitehead link, as you can easily check. So we are supposed to find Seifert surfaces for the two components in the complement to the other component. And here they are. This light blue Zeichert surface uh, is sort of the obvious one. You uh, essentially have it in this picture implicitly. And the second one, well, we, we, we start from this uh, disk uh, spanned by this red component, and then it intersects the blue component in two points. But then we attach a tube, and then we, we get rid of that intersection. So we have uh, two different surfaces and they intersect along this green curve here. Um, so this is th this was called F and then we were supposed to look at its um, uh, self-linking number, which is a linking number of F with its push off. Well, and we, we are free. So let's take the push off within this blue, light blue surface sigma prime. It's quite easy to see this push off because this blue surface is almost flat. So, so this push off looks like that. And you can see that uh, the green curve and this blue curve are going to have linking number two. Okay, so the beta invariant of this uh, W2 is the linking number of F is that push off or this push off, and it is two. And similarly, if we do n full twists here, we will get linking number n here. Okay. Uh, now let's define, let's extend Cochrane derived invariance to topological link. Again, we start with a logical link with linking number zero. Uh, we repeat the previous constructions. So we take a sigma as circuit surface for K in the complement to K prime and sigma prime as I surface for K prime in the complement to K. We take their transversal intersection. Well, if this transversal intersection F is empty, we can make it non empty just by artificially creating some intersection between these two surfaces. And if this intersection F is disconnected, we can make it connected by attaching tubes, for example, to sigma, uh, so that they run along uh, some paths in, in sigma prime connecting different components of F. 
okay, so in this way, we may assume that F is connected. And then uh, we, let us replace the first component of our link, which was K here, by this uh, push of F plus plus. Because it is connected, we again get a two component link. And because this uh, push off F plus plus is disjoint from sigma prime, which was a Zyphert surface for K prime, uh, it is un uh, it has linking number zero with K prime. So, uh, this link has linking number zero. And it's convenient to call this link the uh, derivative of F. Well, obviously there is a choice here that we replace the first component with this uh, F plus plus. So we can call it the first partial derivative. Derivative along the first component. So to say. And now uh, we can apply the subtle in environment to this derivative or to any iterate of this derivative. Uh, so, uh, let us define beta one as just beta and beta two will be the beta of the derivative of L and beta three will be the beta of the second derivative and so on. Theorem, each beta I is well defined and is an I equivalence invariant. So here again, it's just a matter of writing carefully what Cochrane um, I have meant in his mind and uh, using Steenward homology. We can also look at uh, another series of Cochrane environments if we interchange the two components of the link. So that gives us actually different environments. In the case of the subtle again environment, that doesn't give anything new, but in the case of higher Cochrane environments, that gives us other environments and, uh, okay. So let's look at examples now. Going back to our twisted whitehead links, uh, yeah, we have this uh, intersection curve F again, same as before. And if you look at the pair consisting of the first component, which is red and this of F. Well, okay, we, we, we were supposed to look at F plus plus, but obviously F plus plus is very close to F and it doesn't, it is isotopic to F and the complement to this right component can be anti-isotopic. So, so, so we can look at the pair KF and this is obviously unlinked in this picture. So the second series of Cochrane invariants will be zero except for the subtle Levine invariant which was not zero for this twisted line. Now, let's look at the pair consisting of this uh, green curve F and the second component, the blue one. This is not so obvious that it is uh, trivial, but well, if we remove this red component, then you can see that this blue square can uh, Vanishes essentially, and then have this picture, and this little uh, kinks can be unfolded one by one until we get a trivial link. Uh, so, again, uh, this uh, uh, pair, when we replace the first component by our self intersection, by our intersection curve, is the trivial link, and then the original Cochrane invariants are also zero, except the subtle link. Okay, so for these twisted whitehead links, uh, what do we have? All higher Cochrane environments vanish, and the subtle Levine environment assumes all possible values as uh, if we change the twisting, the virus of twisting. Uh, so now, a more interesting example twisted Milner stick. So here, this large dashed square can contain several fragments like that. So in this case, it contains two such fragments and also this third one, which is slightly different. 
So the point of this is, well, we will, I would say that we have three fragments, so M equals three in this picture, but we can have more fragments like that. And then for each fragment, uh, we are free to choose some twisting in this small dashed squares. So each of these twistings, uh, so the full number of twists is an integer, and that gives us a sequence of M integers. For every such sequence, we have a link like that. Well, uh, I claim that the Cochrane invariants of these twisted Milner links are <laughs> uh, uh, very nice. So they vanish, uh, uh, better i vanishes when i is greater than m, and when i is less or equal than m, then beta i just picks the twisting which occurs at the i's right. So for example, here, we would have beta one equals one, beta two equals zero, and beta three equals minus one, and then zero, zero, zero. Uh, and for the other Cochrane sequence, it is all zeros except for a Satellitian invariant, uh, because it is symmetric. Uh, we cannot make it uh, uh, what we want, but all other ones, it turns out, are independent in the two sequence. Only the subtle even invariant is common. Okay, <clears throat> so it might may look like something complicated already, but in fact this is very easy to see, and I think it is quite uh, beautiful mathematics. So uh, we want to compute, the, for example, the derivative of this. Uh, so let's uh, let's find the derivative of, of this uh, twisted Milner link. Uh, Sergey, you, you, you're a bit over time, so if you could finish up in the next couple of minutes, please. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I have just two more slides. Uh, <clears throat> so the next example is going to prove the theorem. So here we we take. We take the obvious ciphered surface like that light blue one for this uh, blue component and the obvious ciphered surface for this red component which has this tube and then they intersect along this green curve and then if you remove the red component you can see that this blue square uh, disappears then uh, you can push this blue uh, finger back like this and then push it back with these kinks and they also disappear. And what you get in the end is a link of that kind. There's another twisted Milner link, but uh, with just two fragments. So by the same procedure, you can see that in the general case, uh, this derivative of a twisted Milner link is equivalent to a twisted Milner link with N1 omitted. And then, uh, yeah, okay, okay. So from this, from this, because we have computed the Cochrane, the Cochrane invariance for the whitehead link, which is in the end here for a twisted whitehead link. And well, in the same way, you can compute it. You can make that computation. So it should be quite obvious now what these values are. But now we can make the infinite iteration and consider this infinite uh, twisted Milner link. Uh, which now has infinitely many indexes. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, the beta i invariant is going to pick the i-th number here. So, well, the, uh, this zephyr surface for the blue component is going to be, is going to touch this point of wildness, but otherwise all this construction is going to be away from the, this point of wildness, all these intersections. So. Uh, nothing new happens really with respect to the previous example. Uh, okay, so let's write this uh, power series. This beta i invariance can be arranged into a single power series. Let's call it Cochrane power series. And in these terms, we have proved the following zero. For every formal power series with integer coefficients, there exists a, a topological link whose Cochrane power series equals a given power series. It's just this 
link uh, that you see in this picture, uh, just instead of this indexes, we have a power series which contains the same, same information. Okay, now Cochrane himself proved the following theorem. If L is a PL link, then this power series is rational. And it's possible to deduce it from a new formula, which I will uh, not go into, in, into much detail, but it just says that this Cochrane power series is really just a quotient of two Conway polynomials, where K prime is the second component and lambda is a certain band connected sum of the components. Now, from this uh, rationality theorem of Cochrane and from the realization theorem of the previous slide, we get the following corollary. If you have any non rational power series, then the corresponding link, uh, which we had in the previous picture, is not going to be I equivalent to any PL link. Because Cochrane invariants were invariants of I equivalence. Each coefficient of this power series is an invariant of I equivalence. And for example, if you take just the sequence of factorials, that's going to be a non rational power series, and that gives you an explicit wild link, which is not I equivalent to any PLD. Thank you. That's all. Okay, let's all thanks, Sergey, for his talk. I have a question. Yes. Could you reformulate what you are doing in such a way to say that um, like an infinite massy product will separate uh, PL links from your links from topological links? Good question. Well, the massy products, uh, they have indeterminacy. Uh, they're like, uh, they are defined when, when, well, okay, okay, they are defined when some previous ones vanish. Uh, that would be a better way of saying that. If the previous ones do not vanish, then they are defined in this case of links not as integers, but as uh, residues, uh, modular the greatest common divisor of smaller massy products. So, uh, with massy products or equivalently with Milner's mu bar invariants, you are not going to have an infinite sequence of integers. And th this turns out to be essential. So uh, I actually have a theorem which says that uh, massy products or equivalently mu bar environments do not suffice to, to, to prove it. So uh, uh, you see this ph phenomenon that you have a non-rational non power series for this, you absolutely need uh, to have every uh, coefficient to be from to be an integer. You cannot just take uh, some residues in infinite uh, residue classes uh, because that, that, then uh, it doesn't work. Well, it's 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 not it's not trivial actually. So 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 it there is a certain Higman lemma about. Uh, well-ordered trees, um, which, which, so it's in my paper. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Since uh, we've only got two minutes until the next uh, talk is supposed to start, why don't we uh, stop here? If there are further questions, uh, I'm sure Sergey would be happy to answer them by email or, or you can discuss yeah, or, them in the chat or things like that. Or in the break, yeah, thank you. Yeah, or during the break, good, good point. Okay, well, so let's uh, do a quick thank you again.